Taron Shiki is about as big of a hero that the world has ever produced. Just like the brave men and women who heroically risked their lives as first responders on the morning of September 11th, Terence was one of the first responders to save lives on the morning of April 19th, 1995, in Oklahoma City during the chaotic aftermath of the OKC attack. Terry was a 30-year-old, 7-year veteran of the OKC PD and had been honored with several professional recognitions, awards, and accolades for his heroism and unbelievable bravery during the wake of the tragic event, including even a Medal of Valor. Recognition for his actions comes as no surprise either. He was one of the first, if not the very first, responders on scene, having arrived within only 10 minutes of the blast. He worked tirelessly for hours, selflessly running straight into the rubble and wreckage, carrying out no less than eight people from the debris, and no doubt saving their lives. Terry had been promoted to sergeant just a few months earlier, and he was actually planning to move to Dallas, Texas to start working for the FBI. He had recently reconciled with his ex-wife, and virtually everything was looking positive in his life before these events of that morning that changed his life forever. Unfortunately, however, he never had the opportunity to take that job with the FBI. On May 8th, 1996, almost a year after he had proven himself as a true hero in every sense of the word, Terry was found in an empty field next to a tree, the victim of multiple injuries, but most critically, a single gunshot wound to the head. His tragic passing was outright classified as a suicide, with no formal investigation, and even before an autopsy had been conducted. As with the story of Kenneth Trentadu, the devil of his passing is truly in the details, and as upsetting as those details are, they are critical to consider when looking at his case. Terry's family believe he must have seen something that morning in the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, having arrived on scene before practically any other authority. Terry had called his wife shortly after news stories of the explosion broke, clearly upset and crying. He told her, quote, It's not true. It's not what they're saying. It didn't happen that way. This is a good time to point out that we are not disputing the official story of what happened. We're not even going to get into any of that because this video is primarily about Officer Yiki and how the world was robbed of a truly awesome dude. That being said, these statements to his wife are relevant because it shows what was going on with Terry almost immediately after being faced with the horrors that he saw that day. His family also says that he was being persecuted by his own department and colleagues, and that his car and his home had been broken into and items had been stolen, and that he started receiving threats after he tried to report the details of whatever it was that he personally witnessed in the rubble of that federal building. And finally, he revealed to his wife Tanya that he was upset about something he had seen under the daycare center of the building while rescuing survivors. He also explained that he had tried to return to the scene with a camera so that he could capture photographs of what he had seen, but that federal agents refused to let him. It wasn't long after this that he began accumulating records and documentation, and he continued to collect this data all the way up until the day that he passed. At one point during this ordeal, Terry claimed to his close friend and family that the quote feds were following him around and that he was in fear for his life. He was so concerned, in fact, that he refused to let his wife take him to the hospital despite feeling extremely ill on one occasion, telling her that they can find me there, although he never told her who they were, almost undoubtedly trying to protect her from knowledge that he considered to be dangerous. Shortly before his final moments, he explained to friends that he was temporarily leaving town so that he could either hide or secure the information and the documentation that he had been collecting. And when talking with a friend about meeting up for dinner as they had planned, he again said that he was being followed by federal agents and that he was going to shake them off his tail before that they met for their dinner arrangements. Now, this would be the last known conversation that anyone had with Sergeant Yiki. He never arrived for that dinner that he had planned with his friend. The next day, on May 8th, 1996, between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m., his vehicle was found in El Reno, Oklahoma, a mile and a half from the state prison. Soon afterwards, his unresponsive body was found under a tree in an empty field. It was reported that his car was covered in blood. There was even blood found between the window panels towards the back seats. In the glove box, investigators discovered an unidentified knife, the keys to his police cruiser, and razor blades. One of the first patrolmen to arrive on the crime scene said that there were boxes full of documents inside the car as well. Unsurprisingly, none of the papers or data that Terry had been collecting were ever seen again. And of course, there was no mention of it anywhere in the police report. Tragically, Terry was found brutally mutilated as if he had been tortured before he was shot. The path of the projectile wasn't any less suspicious either, showing a bizarre and uncommon angle, especially for a suicide possibly as if he had been shot by someone standing above him and firing downwards. 
The bullet entered his skull towards the top and exited through the bottom of his face on the opposite side near his cheek. He was covered in cuts and stab wounds. He had a total of 11 stab wounds and deep slashes along his arms, including cuts to both of his wrists and the inside of his elbows, as well as deep cuts on his neck near his jugular veins. Other cuts and slashes on his forearms were described by investigators as defensive wounds, as if he was fending off an attack. He had deep imprints on his wrists consistent with those left by handcuffs and what appeared to be rope burns along his neck. Grass and dirt was also found inside his wounds, implying that he may have been dragged along the ground. Now, despite the unusual angle in which the small caliber handgun had been used and the fact that no powder burns were found in the areas of the entry wound, no homicide investigation was ever initiated. And perhaps one of the strangest elements of this case, the handgun was nowhere to be found even after extensive searches of the area had been carried out by the police. Somehow, however, after the FBI had arrived on scene to assist in the search, they were able to find the pistol almost immediately, virtually effortlessly. Is it even common for the FBI to investigate alleged suicides of adults? It would be interesting to see how many other suicide investigations that the FBI assisted in. So, the story that was told is that Terry was distraught over marital problems, the horrors that he had seen during his rescue efforts, survivor's remorse, and that he was heavily intoxicated. However, things were claimed to have been going great in the relationship with his wife. They were spending time together again and even had plans to get back together eventually. And also, his toxicology screen came back as negative for any drugs or alcohol. These stories are always deeply tragic, especially in the case of such a heroic first responder. And despite the seemingly suspicious details, it would just be irresponsible to come to any concrete conclusion here in a lowly YouTube video. But it would also be irresponsible and just plain disrespectful to assume that he decided to mutilate himself with a bladed instrument before walking over half a mile into an empty field, handcuffing himself tightly enough to leave marks on his wrist, and then somehow taking his own life by holding the weapon at a completely bizarre angle, and then at some point even making the weapon invisible to anyone besides federal agents, and also at some point making making boxes of documents disappear. Not to mention, Terrence was anemic, and it's been stated that it would be extremely difficult, if not nearly medically impossible, for him to have walked such a long distance while in the process of essentially bleeding to death. Remember, his throat had been cut on both sides near the juggler vein before he supposedly walked over half a mile. If he had inflicted these wounds after arriving at the tree, it would contradict the blades being found in the glove box and the massive amount of blood inside the car. Now, is it 100% impossible? Of course not, but that's why we're avoiding any conclusions here. However, on top of all these details, the crime scene had been completely destroyed, the ground had been dug up with shovels, so any gunpowder test, ballistic test, and fingerprints, along with any type of forensic evidence, was either destroyed, lost, or not even considered at all. And if all of this wasn't enough, the authorities were then irredeemably insensitive to the family. When they pressed for answers to the obvious questions and inconsistencies, they were told by the authorities that they had been watching too many movies. Is that the treatment that the family deserves? This man deserves a statue in honor of his heroism and a plaque describing the complete disregard for his own safety while saving the lives of complete strangers. I hate to leave you guys on such a tragic note, but unfortunately there's no happy ending to this story. It's just another example of the confusing and suspicious events that took place in the aftermath of the OKC attack. And sadly, we will probably never have all the answers. We've had countless requests to cover this story ever since we dropped the Kenneth Trentadu video, but there are several other incredible videos that go into very specific detail about this case. So rather than rehash the work that they've done, we think it's much better that we promote them and strongly suggest that you watch them. So we have links to several videos and articles in the description that you should definitely watch, but we're going to end with a few segments from these aforementioned videos. And lastly, we want to thank all of our subscribers and supporters. We have the absolute best and supportive community here on YouTube, and it's because of you guys. So please keep sending in your requests and research tips. We're going to continue our investigation into the Epstein scandal with the video after this one, but don't hesitate to let us know if there are any other topics that you'd like to see as well. Peace.
there were lies told about everything that happened. And I would like for the world to know that his life was just taken away from him for nothing. He started uh, having problems with it, not only at work, but his apartment got broke into, his car got broke into, things were stolen out of his house. He had accumulated reports, evidence, I don't know what at all, but he was going to take it out to a mini storage in El Reno. And he left one, one night and he told a friend of his that they were going to go out to dinner. He says, I got to run out and put some stuff in mini storage. And as soon as I, I shake these feds that are following me, I'll be back and we'll go to dinner. Well, he never came back. Instead, he was found the next day by a Canadian County Sheriff's deputy. Well, they found his car first, and then they found him in a field uh, near the El Reno Penitentiary. The damage to his body was obviously a torture homicide. It was obvious. But what intrigued me the most, that he had several cuts on both of his wrists, inside both elbows, both jugular veins. He'd been beaten. Uh, he had ligature marks around his neck. He had handcuff marks on his hands, on his wrists. And he had a small caliber uh, bullet wound that started above on the right-hand side uh, of his temple and exited low on his cheek with no powder burns. One of the things that surprised me was that there was no autopsy performed. The other thing that really bothered me was we were being told that Terry was high on drugs and drunk. And, uh, of course, the medical examiner's office did a, a report on Terry and his injuries, uh, which was really not an autopsy, but just a uh, an overview. And uh, it showed that his BAC was was zero, meaning no, no blood alcohol content. There was no drugs in his system. It bothered me that they didn't treat Terry like a uh, police officer like he was. Uh, he was. He was a good guy. And he never said to us that I'm depressed. I, I, I'm, you know, I, I need help. Not to me or not to his sisters. I think it's only fair that we know as Terrence's family members what happened.